before we get started with configuring our Postgres database, there are a few things that we need to cover. And one of those things is the concept of tables. And this is a very important concept when it comes to working with relational databases. So a table represents a subject or event in an application. Uh, and so what exactly does that mean? Let's use a example. Let's say we're building out a e-commerce application. All right, you're going to have a table that represents each part of your application. So you're going to have a table for all of the users that have registered. You're going to have a table for all of the different products that you will plan to sell on your website. And then you can have a table for things like purchases and reviews. So each table represents a different subject or event in an application. And what's amazing about these tables is that all of these tables are going to form some sort of relationship. That's why it's referred to as a relational database. And if you think about it, right, the tables that we have listed right here, they're all going to have a very basic and obvious relationship. Right, purchases, right, when a user purchases something, that automatically implies a relationship because every purchase order has to be associated with the user account that actually filed that purchase order. And a purchase order is going to have a list of products that the user wants to buy. So we could see right there all of the tables that we have already form some sort of relationship. And it's really important that when you design your database that you figure out what are these relationships beforehand so that you can design a very efficient database. Right? Just like if we're building a social media application, right? we, are, you, we know we're going to have a table for users. We're going to have a table for posts as well. And we already know that there's going to be a relationship between the two because every post has to be associated with a user because users create posts. So you can see that you know, all data has some sort of relationship with one another. Now, when it comes to tables, we have columns and we have rows. A column represents a different attribute. Uh, and so if we're building out a table for users, we would create a column for, for the name. So this column represents the name of the user. We might create a column for their age, their gender. You might create another column for the email that they use to sign up. You might have a column for uh, their billing or shipping address, right? It's up to you to figure out what are the different attributes we need to model a specific user. Then we have rows. Rows are very simple, right? Each row represents a different entry in the table. So if we have a user's table, then each row represents a unique user. So row one, this is the user, uh, Vanessa. Row two is going to be the user, Carl. So each row just represents a different entry within the table. Now, databases have data types just like any programming language. And the reason why this is important is that when you create a column within a table, you need to specify what kind of data type you want to use. And that decision is going to be ultimately based off of what attribute this column represents. Uh, and so we have data types, uh, just like any other programming language like Python. And so if we were building out a table for, you know, social media posts, one of the things that we might have is a column for what are the total number of likes or retweets. And so for something like that, you would want some sort of data type that's numeric, you know, a data type that models numbers. And in Python, you know, we have two main data types. We have integers and we have floats. Integers being whole numbers, floats giving you decimals. Well, Postgres has the same thing, right? It's going to have integers. It's going to have decimals and a few others. Keep in mind that uh, you don't need to worry too much about that. Just understand that there are numeric data types within Postgres that are just like Python. So when it comes to the number of likes of Postgres, you know, maybe we would use something like an integer because we're not going to have a half a like or anything like that. Then if you're trying to model, uh, you know, someone's name or email or address, right, we would use some form of text. And within Python or any programming language, you have strings that allow you to represent text. Within Postgres, we have the same thing. It's just called something different. We have uh, varchar, which is just short for varying character, which is once again, just a string fundamentally. And then we have text, right? They're both going to do the same thing. Don't worry too much about the differences. Just understand that Postgres does allow you to work with text, just like any other programming language. It's just called something different. Uh, and then uh, for Booleans, Postgres and Python, they both support Booleans. They're going to work the same way. It's either true or false, very simple. Uh, and then within Python, we have lists. So anytime you want to model, uh, you know, multiple instances, so a list of something, uh, we have arrays within Postgres. And you'll see that when you work with relational databases, you'll see that arrays aren't used very, uh, very much because a lot of times if you're using an array, it may be better to take that column and just convert it into its own table. Um, but like, like I said, you know, don't worry too much about that. We'll go over that in some upcoming, uh, upcoming lectures. When we create a table, we have to specify something called a primary key. 
and a primary key is a column or a group of columns that uniquely identifies each row in a table. So what exactly does that mean? Well, we need to tell Postgres essentially, how can we uniquely identify each entry in our table, each row? Uh, and so we have to give it a special column that ensures that every entry uh, for that specific column is unique. And keep in mind that we can only have one primary key per table. You can't have more than one. However, a primary key can span multiple columns. However, let's keep things simple for now and just assume that primary keys are really just one column. And so a lot of times when you create a table, what we have is a column for a unique identifier. So anytime you create a new user, usually you're gonna have an ID associated with that account and that ID is gonna be unique. Uh, and so the ID associated with John is going to be 77498. And that's how we uniquely identify uh, each user based off of that ID. And so it makes sense to select that as the primary key because we already know that each ID is going to be unique. So it fits the perfect definition of what a primary key is, right? And so the only requirement for something to be a primary key is that each entry must be unique, no duplicates. We can't have this same ID for another user. And so you're probably thinking at this point that, hey, we're gonna create an ID column for every table and then make that the primary key. And I'm gonna tell you that that's not quite correct. The primary key doesn't have to be the ID column always. In fact, your table doesn't even have to have an ID column, right? It's up to you to decide if you actually wanna have that. There are certain instances where you may not want an ID column. Uh, and so you know, if you don't wanna use the ID column or if you don't have an ID column, you need to ensure that you have some column that's able to uniquely identify each and every entry. And so one good example of that when sticking to the user's table example is that generally in an application, a user can only sign up with an email once. So we know that an email is always gonna be associated uniquely with one account, right? We can't have two users with the same exact email. That's not gonna work. That's usually not allowed. So we could definitely use our email column as a primary key. But there's plenty of other examples, right? Phone numbers, right? Generally, I can't sign up with the same phone number uh, for two different accounts. So we know phone numbers are gonna be unique. Uh, for the guys that are in the United States, you know what a social security number is. Two people can't have the same exact social security number. Uh, and so there's a lot of different things that you can use to choose for the primary key. Uh, just keep in mind, it's not always the ID. So that's the main thing I wanted to focus on in this slide. Now, as we go through creating our table uh, and creating each of the individual columns that represent a certain attribute for uh, that table, uh, we can add in extra constraints for each column. So we can put in extra little conditions. And so we already talked about the column that's going to be the primary key. And we know that the primary key has to be unique for each and every row. But what happens if we have another column that isn't the primary key, but we want to ensure that each and every entry has a unique value for that specific column, right? So take a look at the name column in this case. Let's say that we, we won't allow two users to share the same exact name. Is there any way we can tell Postgres to perform that check for us? Well, we can add in what's called a unique constraint. So we can, when we create the table, say that I wanna make this column unique by adding the unique constraint. And so that way, anytime I add in a new user, it's going to check the name and it's gonna to check to make sure that there's no other users with the same exact name. And if there is, it's going to throw an error. And we can do this with any column. Uh, you can do it with all your columns if you wanted to. Uh, that's not necessarily something you're gonna do, but I just wanna make sure you guys understand that you know we can perform extra checks for each entry um, by adding in a constraint. The first constraint that we covered is the unique constraint, but there are plenty more. Now, the next constraint is called the null constraint. And when it comes to creating columns, uh, by default, Postgres allows you to leave a column blank, essentially. So I can add in a new user, and I can say that um, I can leave the name column blank. So instead of having Vanessa for the first one, I could just leave it blank and not put any data in. And so what Postgres will do is it'll put in a value of null because we didn't provide it. And I could do the same thing for age. I don't have to pass in an age by default and I don't have to pass in a gender by default as well. And it will put in a null value for each and every one of those. But let's say we want to tell Postgres to perform a check and say, hey, I don't want you to be able to create a user that doesn't have an age. So what we can do is we can put in a constraint and this constraint is called a not null. That means we are not going to allow it to be null. Right? We are not going to allow Postgres to use a null value. So if we try to add in a new user called Carl and we don't give it an age, well, Postgres sees that this column is not allowed to be null and it's gonna throw an error because it's not null. So that's the second constraint. And I think these are the two main things that I wanna focus on 
And I think at this point, we have a good enough understanding of the different things that we can do with tables, columns, and rows that we can go ahead and start playing around with Postgres and really digging deep into how tables are created and how they work.